Hello, everyone, and happy 2016. I'm Ann Ganguza, and welcome to our sixth monthly voiceover rates and digital ad reform roundtable. A huge thank you to my co-host, Mr. Dave Corvassier, Yay. Woo. and World Voices Organization for their sponsorship of these monthly roundtables. And can I say what a privilege it is to be working with an amazing team of people. Uh, together, we're committed in our mission to be an educational resource for the voiceover community. So we've got a great panel lined up for you today, talking about the latest in international rates. So let me get right down to business and introduce my colleagues. We'll begin with Ms. Christina Malizia, who is president and founder of the Global Voice Acting Academy. She's previously worked as a talent and localization coordinator for Creativity Incorporated. Her responsibilities included casting and directing international talent, contract negotiations, affiliate management, and session coordinating for international projects. She's also bilingual and assisted in all South American and Spanish communication. Thanks, Christina. <laughs> Happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, Simone Foyel. Let's see if I did that right, Simone. I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I was practicing, so you can, you can say that once I finish the introduction. Simone is a Spanish voiceover artist who's been involved in the industry for over 25 years, born in Uruguay, and has been living in the U.S. for 10 years already and has built a solid career. And she is extremely active in the VO field, for all those, <laughs> those of you that know her. She's one of the most enthusiastic Spanish-speaking members of WOVO. And amongst her other activities, she's the director of the Spanish program at VO Atlanta, a VO coach, and is next to launch the first VO agency specialized in Spanish VO narrators. So I'm very excited to hear about that. For the learning industry, yes. Yes. Mr. Dan Hurst. Dan is a bilingual voice talent. His VO career had found its stride back in the 90s. Uh, when they began to connect with international companies and producers who needed someone to help tell their story in both English and Spanish. So he's used his multi-language uh, fluency to build up a great client base, including Volkswagen, Coca-Cola, Wovo, and among many others. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Mr. Darren Altman, a voiceover artist based in London, is a trained jazz musician and has... An, a unique understanding of pitch and timing and can deliver a huge range of accents, dialects and characters and celebrity impressions. So hold your requests until the end, please. <laughs> uh, he's played and developed characters for computer games, animations, cartoons and exhibitions. And his clients include ESPN, there's a, a, a tremendous list here, Xbox, BBC Radio, McDonald's, NBC, ITV, the History Channel and others. Thanks for joining us, Darren. Nice to see you. Deb Monroe, the VO, also known as VO Chef Deb, located in Canada, recently celebrating 25 years in the industry. So we've got some, wow, long time. Uh, always has something cooking in the kitchen. So a full-time talent coach, writer, demo producer, and life coach and personality reader and more. She loves what she does and is always happy to share her experiences with others. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yenny Alvarez. Hi, Yenny. Leading voice in today's growing Latin market, her successes range from the top-rated award-winning Telemundo sitcom, and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't actually pronounce that, so I'll let you do that, uh, to the voice of national commercial campaigns for Albertsons, Target, TJ Maxx, um, also the Spanish voice of Wild Style in the Lego movie video game, and also you can hear her uh, on Happy Feet, and currently shows such as Disney's Handy Manny, Monster High, and the upcoming Nickelodeon's Get Blake, as well as Disney theme parks. Thanks for joining us, Aunt Jenny. And we have Mehmet Onur, who runs an Hi. international VO talent agency in Istanbul and has been working as a professional VO artist for over 20 years. He also runs a production company, which produces TV shows, corporate videos, uh, and TV promos. And he's also uh, worked with lots of voice agencies all around the world as well as talent. Thanks so much for joining us, Mehmet. You're welcome. Nice to see you all. Wow, so we have a, we have a fantastic panel here. Yeah. Except I don't think I suit it. I don't speak any other language. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I obviously don't either, so that's okay. <laughs> and uh, Yenny, Yenny, I can't hear you for some reason. I just wanted to let you know. Yeah, Can everyone else hear her? No. Keep. I want to because I've been wanting to meet Yenny forever. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Yenny. No, we're still not hearing you, Yenny. 
Nothing yet. Um, what about bottom left, Yenny? The microphone. Yeah, check, check the screen. The bottom left of your screen might let you. No. No. Okay, well. Check your settings. Check your settings. You know what? I'm going to go outside. Screen. Oh, there, oh, there you go. Okay. There you are. Right. Oh, there you are. Right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. <gasps> oh, I just pulled the little thing out. <laughs> well, let's get started with our we conversation. Uh, I want to add my welcome to, uh, to Anne's. It's just, you know, it just floors me that the technology allows us to have all these people join in such great quality of video and audio from different parts of the world. Um, we, uh, we assembled all you people because we feel you have special uh, contributions to this conversation. I'm going to start with Mehmet because it's 11 o'clock in Istanbul. And we appreciate especially his joining us so late because he's got to catch a flight first thing in the morning. So thank you, Mehmet. And uh, you sit at the crossroads of a busy part of this world. Do you see strictly international work from where you sit? Yeah, of course. Um, as a producer, as a voiceover producer, uh, I'm selling lots of uh, international voiceovers in Turkey because people are selling their, I mean, Turkish people selling their products all around the world. To, to the States, to UK, to Germany. That's why they need, I mean, the production companies mm -hmm. um, need uh, variety of voiceovers in every language. But of course, the number one language is English. Okay. Best selling language is English. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, uh... then I can tell uh, for, for Turkey, I'm selling first English and American English first. Second, British English, and third, uh, German and Russian. But we have bad relationship with, with Russia now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Politics always involved. Uh, yeah, I know. I don't know what will happen. Simon, uh, let me ask you. You're in Tampa. You're um, close to the South American market. How much of your work is done in Spanish? Uh, my work or my casting manager. <laughs> Here we go. Um, uh, uh, the, the work you do as a talent. Uh, no, uh, I would say that 90% of the work that I do is in Spanish, yes. But par particularly for the American market. Um, so you don't have clients, say, in your home country of Uruguay? No, certainly <laughs> no. Um, and that, that is something that hurts me a lot because since I left Uruguay, I they consider me expensive now because I live in the mm -hmm. United States. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, you know, that's a big mistake because uh, non-union rates here in the United States are pro pro probably uh, lower than in, in Uruguay. But mm -hmm. since they see me, you know, very active in, in a first world mm -hmm. country like the United States, they think that my rates are 10 times what they charge in Uruguay. Is so, it indeed about at that level at 10 times? That's their imagination. <laughs> That's what they think. And and uh, working for the Uruguayan market is very different than working for the American market. In, in what sense? Explain that. Sense, in many senses, because uh, they're very slow uh, at the moment of taking decisions or responding to emails. Or just to give you an idea, about a month and a half ago, I I received a proposal from a, a production company in Montevideo and I was very happy, you know, oh my God, at last, you know, after all <laughs> these years, I'm going to do something for the Uruguayan market. And, uh, and they asked me to do the creative copywriting for a corporate video that they needed for a large, large company. And I'm not going to say the name or, or the, uh, the area of expertise of this company. Um, they wanted me to do the creative copywriting, the translation from Spanish to English, for which I thought that it would be a good idea to hire a third party for doing so, and the voiceover, both in Spanish and English. And they had to pay up front 50%. That, that's what I asked. Uh, and they agreed. And they paid me. And uh, they were on a super rush. And at the end, they, they never gave me a, a reply of, of what they wanted to do. So we never started. We, we, I, what I did was just the creative copywriting. I don't know if they approved it or not. And I never heard back from them mm. again. Well, that's frustrating. So it's sometimes it's very informal, but of course it depends on the, on the people you deal with. 
not everybody is the same, not even here in the United States. Mm -hmm. But here in the States, what I find is that people are more formal and more respectful about your work, about your time, about your mm -hmm. expertise. Mm -hmm. In other countries in Latin America, they, they see you as, um, they are doing a favor to you for what mm -hmm. you do. It's not, mm -hmm. uh, it's not the opposite. You know, they don't see you with the respect that they look at you mm -hmm. here. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that happened to me with other countries in, 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 in Latin America. They, they think that my rates, which are very reasonable, because again, I'm non-union, they think it's, they're very high and I'm charging the minimum what I would charge here in, here in the United States. And mm -hmm. they think it's very expensive. So it's very hard. Yeah. Dan, how many international clients uh, do you keep busy? Um, it, you know, it's kind of interesting. I was perusing over my, uh, you know, end of the year type thing. And um, I have, uh, of my roster, my client roster, uh, I have my, my international, and I differentiate between international and foreign. I, I consider those two separate categories. Okay. Because of the way they charge and the way they do business. Uh, but combined international and foreign, that makes up half of my client roster but only a third of the business. Mm. And so um, there's, there's about s between 60 and 70 active clients. How, how do you distinguish between foreign and international? What distinguishes that? Borders. Uh, if I'm dealing with a company whose business that I'm involved in is going to cross inter international or national borders, then I consider them an international client. And I've learned that international clients pay much, much better than foreign clients hmm. whose work is generally local or regional. Hmm. And in other words, if I'm dealing with a client who's doing something strictly in uh, Shesheng in, in, in China, for example, um, that's strictly a foreign client because that work is only going to stay in that market. Oh, I see. Okay. But if I'm dealing with a Volkswagen, for example, that work is for example, a Volkswagen in Germany uses me in South America. And so obviously that's international client and obviously the pay is better. Hmm. Interesting distinction. I hadn't heard that before. Yeah. De um, De Deb Monroe, let's hear from you. You're in Toronto. It's an international city. How much work do you see crossing uh, studios, desks uh, in that city that, that is international? Well, you know, I'm, I'm really an international client uh, talent I'm not really a local talent anywhere I, I moved here just a couple of years ago so I'm a local talent to Toronto but three quarters of my business is done at home I do almost everything from home so it's all over the place but I would say if I was to put a ratio to it I do about 40 percent international so but to me the other 60 percent is North American not mm -hmm. Canadian mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. It's probably 25 percent how, how sensitive do you have to be to cultural differences mm -hmm. for your foreign uh, clients well you have to be very sensitive because each one has a different standard and, and really what I hear for, for those that actually are in the international market in a language sector as well that have been raised in it it's an expectation the expectations are completely different from one country to the next for me one of the biggest things a little bit aside from rates I guess but at the same time very imperative I think to the conversation for me is I am more sought after in the international foreign markets so I, would, I, would, I like the way you're using that Dan I think that's brilliant you know it is there's, there's, there's the international market and there's a the foreign market in the foreign markets I'm extremely sought after because of my sensuality in my voice I have a very sultry tone to my voice and the Americans think it's slutty and they don't want it unless I'm a male if I'm a male I can be as a slut <laughs> as a female, I gotta clean it up for all these women who don't want it there so, <laughs> <laughs> so my I have to tone it down so much for the, um, the North American market. I have to sound like I'm a little more of a dumb blonde so that I can make it youthful. That's and so funny. Youthful. And so with my with my my European market especially, they love my sultry tone. So I love when I get to voice for the European market. They're not as fussy. They don't beat me up as much. I, I find that I'm in and out in a couple of reads and they're like, what about rates? wow, look what about, at you. What about European rates? Are they good? 
Uh, some are, and then some are really crap, you there know? You so I've stayed away from the really crappy ones for a long time. And, and, and I will admit I had a really bad lull time last year. And so I got desperate. I'm like, okay, cause they approach me all the time. So I'm always no, 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 no. But this one client that I ended up getting was a, was a really low rate. And I thought I'd check it out at least too. So I could at least say, you know, this is what I agree with. I don't agree. Mm -hmm. well, they had a video dubbing project and the way they had budgeted it out it would have been over $250,000 for me and it would have been a two-year contract. So I look at that as that's a full-time wage for anybody would want to take on it unless you're too busy in other types of yeah. genres yeah. that you can't take that on full-time because <laughs> it would be full-time. But who yeah. doesn't want $125,000 a year, especially if they will take on an amateur type talent yeah. to do it. Yeah. So there can be some Big windfalls out of some of the low budget Europe, the, 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 the international or for, sorry, the foreign clients. But for the most part, it's all five minute, 15 mm. minute projects. Here's my $5 US a finished minute. Whereas another one is, is really expensive. But one thing I really found, if I could just say on this, was I did a talking toy project for a company in Sweden. And when they asked me for my rate, I gave him my session rate, but then I gave him a, a buyout rate for usage. I wanted a usage rate for talking toys. I needed to know the quantity and I wanted to know where that would be priced at. And they were just like dumbfounded that I was asking these questions. Like, well, what do you mean? Isn't it just, here's my $500 for the session. And it's like, Oh no, 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 no. I need to know where your units are. So I offered what I thought was a fair rate mm. and for the, for the amount of usage. <coughs> and they were like, wow, that's, that's way too high for us. We can't do it. We negotiated down to something that was fair for between the two of us. And mm. I thought, again, it was really low compared to what I thought it was worth. But when I pitched one of my agents in, in the States, that same project to say, what would the budget have been? I was too high. Wow. <laughs> so, so I ended up getting more in the yeah. end. So as long as I am valuing myself and, and keeping myself at what I believe I'm worth and my time <laughs> is worth, m m many clients will pay it. And those that don't for me, they're just not the right clients for me. They need, they need to have talent that is more caliber to the fee that they can afford. Okay. Yenny, before you go, can you, do you have just one more second? Yenny's got a, uh, she's, she's in the studio where she's going to step into a job right away. Okay. No, we're not hearing you. No. <laughs> okay. Just real quickly. How, how uh, do you have to go? Oh dear. Do, do you have to go or can Hi. you answer one question real quick? I can answer one question real quick. No, you do, you do uh, almost exclusively Spanish voice uh, work, don't you? Correct. Um, I would say that 90% of my work used to be in Spanish. Now it's down to 80 and uh, sometimes even 75, depending on the year. I've been doing a lot of cross-cultural stuff. And this is for, is, South, is this for South American clients or? No, this is for the U.S. market. South okay. American clients vary and the rates vary as well. I try to stay away from um, the low paying ones. Right. And I do find out that when they, for example, they called me from a Santo Domingo for a... Uh, radio station and the rates there are comparable to the rates here so it depends on the country for you know which Latin American country desires mm. the, either the, the you know their Spanish right. accent like the Caribbean for the Santo Domingo or if they want um, neutral accent Spanish. and last question do, do you find that work through agencies or do they come to you or how, how do you land Everything. with those? I do as okay. I do SEO for my website. I do have a lot of friends and a lot of agencies that I work with. And uh, this one, I also look for people there that I have spoken to before. And um, I asked them, you know, how do you feel about working with this company? How do you, what are the rates there? Can you guide me a little bit? And they were more than happy to help me out. Okay. Okay. Get going. I know you, I know you're being pressed. Uh, uh, join us back here again, if you can. <laughs> I am. Bye guys. Uh, Hi. Hey, Darren, let's, uh, let's ask you a couple of dumb questions. Uh, uh, you're, you're in England. Uh, you have a lot of clients. Do you work w for clients in Germany, Brussels? Tell us about your work. Yeah, I'm, I'm with um, a lot of agencies um, and production companies. So I'll get calls from maybe a, um, a production company in Germany, uh, Denmark. Um, I did a thing um, the other day. It's for, it was a worldwide TV um, uh, for the under 19s cricket, um, and I dialed into uh, was ISDN to Germany, and then one of the clients was in Dubai, and the other one was Skyping via Sri Lanka. I mean, it was <laughs> bizarre. So, um, did they find um, you? They, yeah, just completely out the blue. Um, 
uh, I, 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 like uh, Yenny was saying, you know, I, I, my, my the SEO on my website is really quite strong. People are finding me for specifically, you know, now, um, and I, I'm very, very proactive. I'm not afraid to, you know, to pick up the phone and call all over the world. It doesn't bother to, you know, it really doesn't. You know, I've got my email all ready to go. I personalize it top, personalize at the bottom. Always call, always get a name. If the person that uh, that um, I need to speak to isn't available, I'll ask the receptionist's name. So all along the way, I'm keeping it personal. Um, and like I said, you know, it, it pays off because I have people ringing me all, all over the world. So, um, yeah, it's good. How, how, do you, how do you negotiate rates in other countries? Do you, do you start with that or, or is that well, one I mean, of the things you talk about? Or? It's, I'm sure it's the same with, with everyone here. Um, uh, sometimes they'll ask my rate and I'll give them a session fee and ask the usage and, and then, you know, make an informed decision. Otherwise, they tell me, you know, a lot of the time they tell me and it's um, then it's up to me to decide whether I want to take it or leave it. I mean, I don't know how it'd be interesting to hear how um, um, the rest of the, the guys feel. But um, I think um, the longer I am on, on, on this journey, I mean, I haven't been doing it for, for a, a massive amount of time. I sort of my full time crossover when I first got my ISDM box was in. 2010 11 2011 apart from then i was sort of mickey mouse in a little bit for the, for the previous years previously but um i think that if you're doing a if you're doing a corporate thing or a web video i always try and check out the company find out who it is obviously if it's a big international client you know then you want a session fee you want usage um let's not talk about tv let's talk keep it corporate or web videos if, if it's a small company and, you know, you can look at their YouTube channel. You can get an idea of how many people are watching their stuff. And if two men and a dog are really clicking on it, you know, then am I going to cut up my nose to spite my face? Am I going to demand mm -hmm. a full session fee plus usage? No, I'm not. Mm -hmm. A lot of my colleagues will say, well, Darren, how dare you? You know, you're letting the rate slip. Well, I'm not really because no one's going to see it. Uh, am I comfortable with, um, with what I'm charging them? Yes, I am. Will I lose sleep at night? No, I won't. Am I shafting the industry? No, I don't think I am. Obviously, if it gets to a certain point, then you have to draw the line and say, I'm really sorry, I can't do it for that. You know, you yep. need to go. Right. But um, it's about balance. It's about trading off and being, being true to yourself, true to the industry. And I think, um, yeah, finding out your market as well. Who's going to see um, and, and hear your, uh, your voiceover at the end of the day? That's my, I mean, if people differ, then I'd be interested to. Yeah. Here. Okay, Christina, we have not heard from you. Thank you for being with us today. Um, you coach, you also do a lot of voice work. How much of your work is international? Um, well, I, I come at this from a number of different perspectives. Um, one being a, a voice talent uh, for of 24 years, um, and one having been the talent coordinator um, and a localization uh expert and coordinator for a recording studio for six years. So I was in charge of all of the talent uh, session, studio contracting negotiations and a uh, currency exchange and um, all of the rates and all of that kind of stuff. So I, uh, you know, getting quotes and estimates and then quoting it back for our clients who we were localizing a product for. So, um, so there's, there's that aspect, which I could speak to. Um, I also, on a personal level, as a voice talent, um, I record a great deal for uh, international clients. Um, I'd probably say one or two jobs a month at minimum. Um, mostly mobile game apps, uh, which are actually all mostly out of China and the Asian market at the moment. Um, so uh, I've been working for several um, companies in uh, Singapore and Hong Kong for over 10 years. Um, and, uh, you know, they continually come back. They're some of my most loyal customers, which is great. So I'm not sure which aspect you'd like me to address. Well, I, uh, rates I, um, specifically, I mean, we're, we're here about rates. And mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering, do you, do you negotiate your own rates? Do you have an agent that does that for you? Do you get that work through agencies? Uh, do you work strictly with production houses? Uh, talk about how you negotiate those rates. 
Most of my international clients have found me in some way, shape, or form. Um, usually it's not through an agency. Um, usually they just uh, either find me through another product I've done. I've been doing toys and games for, again, 24 years. So um, just I have a lot of material out there. So um, they've found me through various methods. Um, so I do, I do negotiate all of those independently myself. Um, I have a standard rate that I usually quote uh, for either a toy or a game, uh, which in includes a buyout for the product usage. Um, you know, toys and games are often a very, it's kind of a one-off sort of thing a lot of times. You know, they have to, they have to create mm -hmm. it in a very cheap way. Mobile game apps are often free uh, to download and play. Um, so, you know, they're not giant high gigs, but they are very steady, which is a nice thing. So there's several mobile game app companies that come out with a new game, you know, every month, every other month. So it's, it's nice regular work. Um, with most of the rates that I quote, I do throw out a rate first. I say, this is my rate, and then we'll discuss it. Um, and uh, usually our, people are really receptive to that, which is great. Um, and, and that's pretty much it. Um, sometimes the negotiations in the beginning take a, a great deal of work because, yes, there's a language barrier. You have to make sure that the terms that you're discussing, you actually have the same definition in your mind of what those mm -hmm. terms mean. Yeah. Um, recently, recently had a, a – actually, we're negotiating an international contract right now where um, our client said, oh, uh, recording time. And in his mind, that meant per finished minute of audio. Mm. Whereas I was talking about session time. So mm. little details like that, mm. making sure everything is written out very clearly. Um, before I do any kind of international work with the client, uh, we have a very specific written out contract saying exactly what the deliverables are, when they're expecting it, in what format, for what rate, what's the rate if it goes over, um, what's the rate if we do two games in one hour, what's the rate you know, if I do additional voices, etc. So what I do is I just make sure everything is written out in OCD detail so that there's no way mm -hmm. That we can miscommunicate because we're going to miscommunicate in some way anyway. At some point, Christina, I, if you don't mind, yeah, I was I, I was really interested in finding out what uh, what considerations in terms of negotiating a, a contract because I think that's probably a very smart thing to do um, because of possible language barriers and, and differences. So, what sort of considerations and is that something that you developed yourself? Uh, yeah, you know, it kind of has been, actually. I just based it off of, because I did so many toys, I based it off of, for mobile game apps, I um, based it on my toy rates back in the day. Because, again, it's a, a cheap format. You know, a toy costs $10, maybe. They have to fit all of this production, and it, they're only going to sell it for that much, which means their whole production needs to be, like, $2, and it's going in a 10-cent chip. So, again, they're not high-paying things, but they are regular. Um, so, you know, I have a flat rate per hour which is inclusive of any amount of voices that they want. So for a character actor, you know, they get a great deal because they can get, you know, up to five or six different characters for one game, all done in an hour. Um, and again, I just charge by the hour or by the game. Um, so I have a flat rate for those. Mm -hmm. And then they can use it really for whatever they want. And so if I can just say something as well, Christina. I'm sure you're finding the same thing. Is I find a lot of the clients that are overseas, I'm able to educate them. They actually don't know they yes. have a, a one price. Well, aren't all voices just this price for this amount of time? And it's like, well, no. Right. Why? And I find them very receptive, most of them, um, that are very receptive to yes. learning about what it is that are the differences because they just didn't know. Uh, I yeah, people are very... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. People are willing to pay. People are willing to pay, um, you know, for, for quality. quality. That's what I've found. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, I have a whole reel of just my mobile game app material. All I have to do is just send them that little video, and usually there's no question about right after mm -hmm. that because mm -hmm. um, they can see I'm professional. So, you know, yes, it's an education process, and I actually educate. I share all my rate information with my clients, with other ladies going into, you know, talent going into this genre so that we can, because everyone is now negotiating for themselves out there, the more in terms of standardized rates that we can all communicate and document, I think the better off we're going to be. So. Well, what a wealth of information. Thank you, uh, Christina. Um, I, I wanted to bring up the topic uh, of the mechanics of being paid because I, I find there are a number of American talent that are really stymied by this. And, uh, and, and Mehmet, I want to bring that uh, question to you first is how do you pay your clients by bank transfer, by PayPal? How do they ask to be paid? Uh, actually, as a voiceover, I prefer wide transfer uh, because in Turkey, PayPal is getting lots of uh, money, uh, yeah. taking lots of money. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes. That's <laughs> why I, uh, I But so is my bank. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's my, I, yeah, my bank takes a ton. Yeah. For the wire yeah. transfer. Well, as a customer, I, I can pay uh, to voiceovers that I work with wire transfer, PayPal, whatever they want. No problem for me. But I, I want to tell you a story. It's a very new story um, about low rates. Um, I think one month ago, uh, a guy from India oh. uh, sent me an email and said, uh, we have a national commercial, and how much do you quote for a national commercial? He said, we also want female voices. One male, one female voice for a national commercial. Uh, all lip sync uh, to the picture, and I gave, him to my, I gave him my rate and said, wow, what? Um, my offer is hundred fifty for both, hundred fifty dollars. I avoid waiting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Simone, you seem like I you don't want to be racist, but say I, about that. <laughs> I'd uh, like to hear I, Simone there too. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting lots of emails from India, um, but I'm just replying. I'm sorry, uh, yeah. but the funny thing is, they did the commercial in Turkey. Mm -hmm. I watched the commercial. Yeah. Somebody well, did know, it. If I can actually add to that, I have a ton of projects because because I'm known for some of the international stuff. I'm known as the Canadian talent because there's a, mm -hmm. a specific need for the Canadian talent. I speak neutral, but but Canadians don't know the difference. It's only the Americans that know the difference, honestly. So I speak American. They just think I'm Canadian. Anyway, so I'm I'm voicing Canadian, and they they um oh sorry where were you going? I, I kind of got interrupted in my thought there. Um, they, ah, there's something you just said that prompted me to say that. I'm so sorry. Um, India. In India. Um, <laughs> they, they will, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm lost it now. It's so important to you. I'll, I'll find it. In a oh, minute. you'll, you'll think of it. What about you, Dan? How, how are you, how do you handle the, the mechanics of the payments? So what, what are you seeing? Well, first of all, I never deal with India. <clears throat> <Yeah>. <laughs> me too. <laughs> That's the first way. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I will. I do have some client. Having said that, I do have some clients in India, but they were they approached me on behalf of a client who hired them to do. These are e-learning clients, and um, having known and having a good relationship with that client, uh, I said, okay, I, I know I'm going to get paid with these guys, and I don't, uh, I don't negotiate rates with them. Um, this is my rate. Take it or leave it. And if they're a new client, you prepay. And that's just the way it is. Yeah. And frankly, yeah. I don't care if they, if they yeah. want to do it. Great. If they don't, I don't care. doesn't matter to me. Uh, I'm happy to do the work. I'll do my absolute best job possible for them. But if they don't want to play my game, we don't play ball. Um, but as far as other, other companies, whether they're international or foreign companies, uh, what I have found is that uh, it's, it's really very relational. If they really know that I really want to do a job for them that is going to make them look good, uh, they're going to be very, um, first of all, open to what I have to suggest. And so before I even get into rates, I begin building value. Uh, this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm not only going to just voice your commercial for you, but I'm going to help you understand if you're saying it the right way. Uh, certainly with international work and foreign work, when you're dealing with clients who are using a second language translator, mm -hmm. they have mm -hmm. problems with the grammar, the syntax, and so forth and so on. And I'll just be real honest with them. I'll help you with that. Uh, I'm not going to do the translation for you for free. But if there's a little mistake here, I'm going to tell you. I'll give you alts. I will, when I'm recording it, um, I'll go along and I'm going to say, here's an alt you might want to consider saying it this way, and I'll do that. So all of those little things add up to value for the client. Having said that then, when I get to a price with them, uh, they begin realizing, this guy's, we're going to have to pay more, but look what we're getting. Well, the truth of the matter is, I think most voice talents would probably do that, but they fail to sell value into what they're doing. Um, international clients are very value conscious and should be. 
And so that's how I approach it. As far as taking payment is concerned, I will use bank transfer, but I will add $25 uh, for bank fees. I just tell them right up front, there's $25 charge for bank fees. Hmm. I will take PayPal. I'll tell you a little secret about PayPal. Uh, PayPal, you can accept payment in the, um, in the denomination of, or the currency of the country. For example, I will take a Euro payment to PayPal and I will accept that as Euro payment. And then I will hold it as a Euro payment until the rates are better, and then I can transfer it over mm. to US dollars. You can do that with pretty mm. much any currency. And that's a very smart way to do it, because otherwise PayPal will just absolutely rip you yep. a new one yep. uh, with rates. But Thank if you. you hold it, then you can, you can watch the currency rates, and when the exchange rates are good, then you can make the change. It's yeah. also good. Like I do the same thing, Dan. And the one thing I'm able to value is I, my assistant is in the state, so I'm able to pay him U.S. funds. Right now, I'd be losing 40%. So for me, thank God I have PayPal, which I've had for almost 15 years and never yeah. been ripped off, never got – but I charge fees for my, for my students. I let them know I'm charging you the fee. For our clients, I incorporate it into the budget somewhat so that it's covered after a while. And it's also a write-off for me, so I have that advantage. Simone, you had a comment? Yeah. Yes, uh, I, I completely agree in, in everything that Dan said. Um, and I'm very conscious about the importance of, of giving a lot of certainty uh, to those clients who do not speak Spanish, for instance, that they're dealing with someone who works um, with a pure Spanish, native Spanish, and that they can, that you can manage other topics that maybe they they don't manage because they don't know the language. For instance, tell them when a translation is properly done or not. Uh, when I, I, I give them a big red alert when I notice immediately that the translation was made through uh, Google Translate. Yeah. Uh, and they think that just by doing this, they have a, the best translation possible, which is not, it's horrible. It's hard, it, but I must admit that it got better through the last year um, because of contributions that people have made, but the translation is not good at all. So I, t I tell them about it, ab about it, and I tell them, I do translations. You can either hire me or hire someone else, but I, in order to keep a good image of your company, I do not suggest you to use this translation. It's mm -hmm. going to damage absolutely the image of your corporation. And they say, how much you charge, yeah. I charge this. And it's a very competitive rate because you're doing the voiceover with me too. So instead of charging 20, 25 cents per word, I charge them 15 cents. Of course, depending on, on the volume of, of mm -hmm. word count, right? Uh, another thing that I offer them is to do um, ad um, adaptation. Uh, adaptation of uh, scripts that need to be dubbed or consent. Okay, why? Because Spanish words, Spanish is a language that is approximately 15 to 20 percent longer than English. So you need to say probably more in less time rather than English. So I, I tell them, listen, we have a problem here. This is what happens with Spanish. I, would, I will be very glad to do the adaptation for you. It, it is very important in, in, in this matter. Is, it is very important that the voiceover talent speaks a pure Spanish because in that sense, it will provide the right tools and the right terms to substitute others in less time. They need to know the language very well, right? Uh, so, you know, that gives a lot of certainty to the client that they're dealing with someone who knows mm -hmm. the language and who is <clears throat> capable of providing that service to them. Regarding to PayPal, um, uh, what I do automatically is add is to add a 4.3 percent mm -hmm. extra to the total, so everything will be covered. Mm -hmm. Wire transfer, what I use wire transfer mm -hmm. with large companies. They automatically uh, offer me that possibility, and I'm very happy for that. And uh, lately, I had an issue with a company that is based in, in, in Ireland, and they have another um, uh, sister company in South Africa for whom I, I record a lot of um, my e-learning courses. Uh, and uh, they, wanted it, they wanted to subtract from the total the word transfer from me, and I told them this is not 
this is not a good etiquette. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's not right because it's not my fault that you're there and I'm here. You know, this is something that generally companies uh, have to assume. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a number that I don't have to pay for. And they agree. Right. Uh, but uh, yes, wire transfer is with large companies that manage a high volume of, of, uh, of people and, and they work with a lot of people overseas. And if I can just say for anyone who's listening that's not in an industry long, you have to be careful who you give your wire transfer information out to when it comes to foreign countries because there is a lot of scams out there. So you need to make sure you've got some legitimacy to the company before you start giving out your banking information too. Great point. Great point. I remembered what I was trying to say. Can I say it now? Please. <laughs> we were talking about how someone from India, for example, is giving work and it's actually work that's actually for the state. So, for example, I got an IBM job from India and, and I've negotiated with this one company to get my rates. So I work for them because they hire my rates and I do the same thing. I, I add on extra for grammar corrections and things like that. But they hire me for IBM. And that, that IBM went to them because they're from India and they do it for two bucks a minute, um. or an hour, I mean. <laughs> and so look at this. Here's our country going elsewhere, yeah. and it's coming back to our country. Yeah, yeah, not fair. For a low budget, not fair at all. Right. Uh, they, um, I just tell them, well, look, you get what you pay for, which I know you all know, and that's how you show it to them. This is, mm -hmm. this is the value we can offer you. You Absolutely. still get that for two bucks a minute, but... You're not going to get the same quality, a caliber of talent and read and care and compassion and, and the value, just as Dan said. Yeah. Mehmet, you were saying something? Yeah. If you're buying my voice as a voiceover talent, uh, you're buying the experience, you're buying the quality, I mean, recording quality, uh, everything else. They, they can find cheap voices in all languages, not in Turkish, not in English. But uh, we are selling, actually, the quality, the experience. The same as a producer. I want to buy experience. I want to buy uh, quality. That's why uh, I'm working with lots of talents as a voice producer. Some talents were working together for 10 years because they're happy to work with me. I'm happy to work with them. Same with the mm -hmm. voiceover uh, jobs that I get, uh, Turkish voiceovers from the companies for the rates i can say uh for example i'm doing mercedes for five years uh, it's not a perfect rate but we're doing it for five years it's a stable job so Mehmet, as a voiceover producer wh where do you go to find north american talent if you're looking for someone new actually um i have some um uh, superstars <laughs> I'm, that i'm working a lot together um, sometimes I look at the pay pay to pay websites, but I'm fine now. I'm, uh, I have relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, um, some of my friends, I can ask my friends. I have lots of go. relations now. I can ask my friends. Uh, yeah. I can ask help from my friends on Facebook, especially. Isn't that great? Yeah, yeah, it's a good community. Yeah, I know mm -hmm. a lot of the foreign agencies are telling me now that they're their English American rosters are getting full. So that's not what they're seeking more. They're actually seeking a lot more a a Atlantic voices now. It's, it's mm -hmm. becoming a new international trend is the Atlantic. So almost that Irish for us in Canada be the Newfie, the Newfoundland voice or, you know, so they're, they're seeing that they're saturating in, in the English American market, not hard to find voices in. That's, that's the one market that's full. <laughs> I'd like to I'd like to ask Mehmet, it, and I might have missed it because I had a period there where my internet connection was unstable. Uh, so it, I, I, forgive me if you've already said it, but Mehmet, are you finding uh, similar challenges because you also run a production company as mm -hmm. you find in voiceover and and how how rates are perceived in production? Because I I have a lot of production friends here that you know they're going through the same frustration that I do as a voice talent. What about you for for a production company? Uh, what do you mean? So can you repeat the question like for, again? for video and uh, for for video production are you mm -hmm. finding the same uh, similar frustration in terms of rates and um dealing with international companies in production as well as voiceover is that a different mentality yeah but uh, i can say that uh, for example the rates in the states are very different as a voiceover mm -hmm. uh, i'm getting uh, lower rates in the states i'm sorry but i'm getting 
higher rates in the Europe. If you, um, but same for me, actually, uh, we have a different system in Turkey. We call it cache. I think it's a French word. Yeah. So one voice over is cache, one cache. So uh, if you have a version, you have to pay half of it. Mm-hmm. I don't care if the voiceover is the same. If the picture changes, you mm-hmm. get half percent of it. So sometimes you get uh, 10 versions, 20 versions. I negotiate. It depends on the project, actually. I don't have a rate card as a voiceover. Mm-hmm. So, of course, I quote. If someone asks, uh, how much you ask for a 30, um, I mean, three minutes a corporate video, I have rate, of course. Mm-hmm. But for the long-term jobs, like e-learning jobs, uh, I can negotiate, no problem. Mm-hmm. It depends on the uh, usage. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hey, Darren, uh, oh, someone will get to you next. I want to make sure Dar- Darren gets another chance to speak here. Uh, so how, how do you tend to ask for your pay? Bank transfer, wire transfer, what? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll give them the option, really. Um, I do a similar thing to Simone. You know, if it's PayPal, I'll, I'll bung 5% on. And, you know, I put that in my email. Um, or wire, wire transfer, uh, really doesn't. Um, I've got, I, I, you know, once a month or once every couple of months, I get a delivery man, you know, rock up in a delivery van with a parcel like that. And I open it up thinking it's Christmas morning. And in there is a little check like that. Uh, <laughs> Bahrain, I think. So, um, you know, I've got some clients out there and they, 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 that's the way they do things, which is, it, it's fine, you know. Um, we, we were talking about, um, on, on, a, on a British um, uh, a voiceover forum, talking about um, payment. And uh, I will generally, I mean, I've got, 30, I've got at the end of my email, you know, payment terms, 30 days. It's not worth the, 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 the paper that it's written on because, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's just my polite way of saying, you know, this is what I'd like in an ideal world. I might as well <laughs> say you know, it, it doesn't make any difference. You know, people will pay you within a day, within a week, within two weeks. And you say, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Or it'll be a month or two months. And if it's longer than two months, three months, you have to start chasing and doing all that. But I think, um, as I think Dan said, it's all about relationships and trust. And, um, you know, if it's, if it's a company uh, or an agency or production company, then there's an element of, of trust that I'm not going to get shafted. Uh, the only time I will generally only um, insist on payment up front is if it comes via my website and I don't know the person from, or if, if it's like a Gmail or a generic address. Otherwise, I just assume they're a legitimate company. And I think there has to be a sort of element in, of trust on my part. Having said that, I have a friend, um, and they said recently, and that's fine, I'm not casting aspersions, they said that they will always insist on payment up front for everyone, regardless, and they said that 90% of the time, they never have any quibbles, no one argues, mm-hmm. they just say, okay, that's your terms, then fine. People work in different ways. I, yeah. I, I like to be sort of open and, and just trust, especially with companies that you can look them up on websites, a company's house we have uh, here and you can see, you know, whether they're legitimate or not. So, Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Uh, can, I, can I add something to something that Darren just said? One of the things that I've noticed is how you um, accept payment from international foreign companies uh, says a lot about your professionalism, uh, perception of your professionalism. And if, I have learned that if I speak to them, and again, it's part of building that relationship, as, as, as Darren alluded to, is if, if they perceive me as a very professional company and not as a just a voice guy, but if they see me as a company and I am a company, I operate as a company, um, I, I should know because I am on probation because I put myself on probation for falling asleep at work one day. So we have those kinds of rules in my company. <laughs> and the the... The, they have to understand that I'm a company also, and I operate as a company. And if they get that perception, that usually weeds out an awful lot of the mm-hmm. question. Mm-hmm. Good point. Part. Good point. Simone, you uh, had a comment. I'm sorry. So can I just very quickly, and just to, just to point, pick up what, what Dad, sorry, um, uh, what Dan said earlier in terms of being 
professional and lay out uh, put your set out your stool when i quote for a job i have an email ready to go and it's that perceived value that that dan was talking about so i say my quote is x and for that it's my and it's bullet pointed to voice uh uh for you to edit for you so you get a broadcast quality clean produced file um if it's you know non-broadcast usage i.e client website e-learning um youtube um, uh, option to direct me via Skype, IPDTL, Source Connect, ISDN or similar. And I set out all these things. And so they think, do you know what? This isn't a guy just talking into a microphone in his bedroom. You know, <laughs> this is what hire of my studio, of course. That's another one. So there's about seven or eight bullet points. So they know exactly what they're getting there for their money. It's not just my voice on an MP3. It's much, much more than that. Right. Simone. No, what, what I wanted to say is that when you deal with international clients, it's very important to, and especially if they are first-time clients, that you ask from them to pay you 50% at least in advance. Uh, oh, yeah. Very, it's common. Very, mm -hmm. very important. Um, and if they come to you directly because they are absolutely delighted with your work, they are fascinated with what the, you do, and they are not doubting at all that uh, they would look for someone else. And if they live in the United States or, or overseas, I have no problem in, in asking them to pay up front if they are first-time clients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At, at least I suggest the possibility to them if they can do it. Uh, and many times I was very lucky, you know, uh, because if they come to you very decided on, on what they want and, and that they want <laughs> You, you want me? Hey. Okay. Hey yeah. Christina, you've been awful quiet. Um, what do you What do you think about all this talk about rates and being paid? And I'm I'm just you know I'm just listening, just absorbing. I, I you know I'm just glad that we have these forums because I, I just think things are changing by the day right mm -hmm. now yeah. in terms of the uh, international relationships that we are all able to have now with as independent voiceover talent and as producers and as companies um, and I just I just think these educational forums are, are more important than ever because everyone is now encountering any individual that can look somebody else up on the internet and reach out to them and, and begin a process like this so um, you know it's being a mobile marketplace forums, yep mm -hmm. so I just I just think it's it's great that we're sharing this info so not sure if there's I, anything else I could input. <laughs> I, okay. I'd like to just have a quick uh, ask a quick question to the, to any of you on the panel. Um, do you have a preferred um, software that you use that that deals with international currencies uh, for counting? Google, because I Google. just to see the currencies. No, to actually work within because I know I've had my own issues with. Uh, uh, accounting software is dealing with with uh, foreign currency and and being able to track and account for it. I. I ran into many problems with QuickBooks, <clears throat> for example. Um, the desktop version is a little different than the online version. The online version now accepts, uh, you know, currency rates. Um, and so, and people can pay in foreign currency. So I was just wondering what softwares you guys might, might use that works well if you do a lot of international work. No, I, I just use the dollars. Do, do, you know, the U.S. dollar is the international currency for everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and internationally speaking, those companies that, that are willing to hire you um, convert automatically uh, what they're willing to pay into U.S. dollars because it's the most international mm -hmm. currency available. Mm -hmm. um, Christina? I usually uh, also uh, convert into U.S. dollars, and uh, when I was negotiating with studios where we had uh, where the currency conversion was uh, very important, uh, you know, we would do. I mean, and it varies by the day. We would create an estimate that they would uh, then approve and sign, and then when we did the final payment, we would use the currency rate that was on the day that we signed to do uh, to do the payment, so that it was all documented. Hmm. I use a software program called Oanda. O a n d a. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's it stays very much up to date on the mm -hmm. current change. So and do you get paid in different currencies, Dan? I do. I accept yeah, payment in pretty much any currency. Like I said, particularly if I can take it to a uh, PayPal because right. I can hold it in that currency until mm -hmm. the exchange rate is better. Mm -hmm. Or if the, if the exchange rate is very good at the time, then I just automatically convert. Right. right. The difficulty I find is uh, which 
Apparently isn't a difficulty. I keep asking accountants about it all the time because I think this is going to eventually change is everybody's going to want their cut in taxes. <laughs> so, you know, right now it's a little difficult where three quarters of my income is really U.S. dollar and I'm Canadian. So when I'm doing mm -hmm. my Canadian taxes, it's really odd because I'm not collecting as much tax as my income is showing, but I can't. I can't charge them the tax because they're from, not from my country, yet I'm doing the work here. Work here, so work here work I'm here. really curious as to how that's going to change in time because I think some people are going to want their cuts because there's a lot of foreign dollars that are going to tax, tax in, in currencies that they're going to want to see. I don't know if you guys have found that. I just know I asked my accountant, and they're like, no, oh, really all well, you can do is you can charge them. We have BST, HST, HST, all these other taxes that we have to charge on everything that we take. I'm getting an echo from you, Deb. Yeah, we're getting an echo from you, Deb. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, you know what? Uh, it is uh, about an hour that we've uh, been talking here. It just has gone like that. And I want to be respectful of everyone's time, especially Mehmet, who's, who I'm sure is getting tired. Um, oh, fine. I'm fine. I, I stand amazed <laughs> nice to be with you. <laughs> I stand amazed at this technology and, and your willingness to come here uh, for this hour and share your wisdom. Uh, yes, wow. thank you. I'm just blown away by, by all the information that came out in this hour. And I'm going to recommend this really highly uh, to everybody to listen to. Um, so, so Dan and Mehmet and Deb and Christina, Simone, uh, Darren, and my lovely co-host Anne, uh, I just give great thanks. Uh, this is being recorded. I will uh, doctor this up and make it presentable and post it later this evening. I will send you each a link. It'll be on the Wovo website. It'll be on our Wovo YouTube channel, my blog. You know, feel free to use and distribute and repurpose as as you wish. Yes, please. Um, yeah, I will uh, any final words, Anne? Blog too. Oh, I'm sorry, Simone. I'm going to republish it too on my blog. Oh, no, great, thank you. Great. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. I'm I'm just so excited that we can do this on a monthly basis because I really feel that we're making an impact and we're helping uh, provide a, a a resource that's needed in the community. So thank you all for your wisdom and your knowledge and and you know and for standing up for you know getting getting fair pay and fair rates and and it really I believe is going to make a huge impact on all of us as a collective. So thank you, thank you all. Thank Thanks, you. Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.